Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to our daily session. The topic I wanted to focus on tonight is related to delusion or ignorance. It's a curious characteristic quality of, of samsara. That it we come to be in a state where we where we don't see things as they are. That might sound a little um, insignificant, but it's actually an incredibly important statement. We know this in science, modern material science. That's why they avoid, to the best of their ability, dependence on perception. And the realization that our perception can be wrong. It's deceiving how simple that statement is, and you might think, I get it, I understand that. But it's guaranteed that when you begin to explore the realm of perception through meditation practice, that you'll be surprised, that you'll be shocked with the realization that you're really just not even, not even uh, distorted th reality but completely misunderstood it and, and, and totally to the extent that black seemed like white, good seemed like bad, bad seemed good. So in, in modern material science they reject perception for this reason. You can't rely on your perception. They recognize this through studies, through experiments. Um, I think in religion, of course, in spirituality, we, we're, we're prone to, to uh, succumb to this. It's how you can come to be so sure of your beliefs, so sure of your convictions and only have them turn out to be wrong. driving around in Chiang Mai and uh, we, were, we were headed somewhere. Our whole, our whole troop, when I was teaching at Doi Sutep, we were heading somewhere to the, we had to get to the super highway and I, I told them to turn left. I said, you have to turn left. There's the su this is the super highway. And this Laotian monkey is like, no, no, that's not the super highway. But I demanded, and finally they turned left, and then I looked and I said, oh, this isn't the superhighway. It's very easy to It's 
it's very easy to be completely sure of yourself and be wrong. The problem, of course, with this stance of material science is that it ignores a very terrible problem with um, with our, our reality and our, our existence. It attempts to sidestep the problem by strict reliance on on uh, on third person impersonal not third person but impersonal uh, observations you know, find ways double blind tests but that doesn't solve the problem that we are really messed up in our perceptions in more ways than science even is I think um, clear about able to understand and so Buddhism does something bold and perhaps seen as impossible by a material scientist and that is to correct our perceptions find a way of being non, I don't know, I used to say objective, but I think that word is used differently by different people. I'm going to say objective. What I mean by that is impartial or unbiased, and even more than unbiased, clear, seeing clearly. We, we, we claim the ability to correct our misperceptions and to dispel the delusion and the ignorance. But I want to emphasize this point, and it's, it's, it's both incredibly important to understand and incredibly important to understand as being uh, the root of the problem, that we can misunderstand, that we can be completely and utterly wrong about something, such that there's no hint of it being wrong, apart from the consequences, of course. And this is the thing is, well, if we perceive things in a certain way, what's wrong with that, right? If I think ice cream is good, What's wrong with that? You like, I like chocolate ice cream, you like vanilla ice cream, right? We all like certain things, we all have certain partialities, perceptions, we all have certain, let's not even talk about partialities, but we all have certain character types. I have a short temper, we say, or I know I'm, I'm this or I'm that. I'm... A type personality, B type personality. It's just who I am. And so you find people trying to uh, perform mental gymnastics to try to make sure that everyone, whatever per type of person they are, is understood as being equally valid. Right? So if, if our perception is different from someone else's perception, what's wrong with that? And the problem is that there is, as it turns out, an underlying reality that doesn't change. You think, well, my reality is different from yours. Well, actually, it's not. And there's no one in this world who can uh, escape a certain fairly simple qualities or characteristics of reality.
So greed, for example, greed and craving and desire and thirst and ambition, these are all very good examples of this. We wonder how, how a person can be, how a person can be driven to, uh, to rape another person, for example. We study addiction, we study de uh, We study passion or, or, or desire, sexual desire is a big one. We study addiction to food and so on. And we can't deny that there are negative consequences to desire. And so intellectually this is easy to accept that, you know, perhaps not, not clear to us, but should be easy to understand that there is an underlying reality that's, that doesn't allow for uh, addiction, that doesn't allow for, for a, a peaceful and a happy uh, addicted state. It's a reality whereby addiction causes suffering. But this, this idea of seeing things completely wrong helps us to understand why intellectual understanding isn't enough. Because in intellectual understanding, what is it? It's a thought. There's no such thing as intellectual understanding. It's, it's a series of thoughts that lead to a single thought with a lot of conviction. So you have this thought, which is your premises, leads to this thought and this thought, and finally you come up with a conclusion. And that has some power to it, it gives you conviction, so it will to some extent affect your behavior, but it doesn't change the fact that when you see cheesecake, you like it, you want it, you think, you feel that that is going to bring you happiness. When you see the object of your desire, a beautiful man, a beautiful woman, when you see the body, when you see... see things, when you hear music, it doesn't change the fact that we get attached, that we become addicted. That it blinds us to any suffering, that you be completely blind. You can rationalize it, you can examine your life and see how terrible you are, how terribly you are destroying your life. Read Dostoevsky, some of his stuff. Pretty hardcore suffering. And he could write about it. He knew what he was doing to his life, to his mind. But the addict can't help themselves. It's it's on totally different, on a totally different level. This is how someone could rape. How, how in the time of the Buddha there was a, a, this novice Samanera who raped his 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 cousin who was a bhikkhuni. She was an arahant, and uh, when he left her kuti, her hut. The earth swallowed him up, they say. He died and went to hell. That a person can't see that that's wrong, right? And yet, there are many people in this world who can't see it's wrong, and we want to call them monsters. We want to say that that is the sort of a person very different from us. That sort of person is nothing like us. But we all have this in us, and and to some extent, it's it's. Um, I mean, it's incredibly blameworthy, but it's also, in a sense, blameless because, according to their perception, it's not blameless, but it's it's. Um, you understand what I mean? It's it's completely, purely, 
this is going to make me happy. There's total ignorance and delusion and, and lack of clarity. They're unable to see, is what I mean. At that moment, the mind is consumed. The mind is clear that this is going to make me happy. And then, oops, <laughs> boy, was I wrong. That's how, that's how this samsara works. That's how we get stuck and why we stay stuck. And that's how insight meditation works. That's why insight meditation works. That's why the answer isn't to force yourself to follow your intellectual understanding, but it's to see clearly. Anger is another one. Anger is, it's incredible what anger will do to you. There was a uh, time of the Buddha, there was this, his stepfather, who was so angry at him, so angry at the Buddha. For taking away his Taking for leaving his daughter, first of all, when he left home, and then for, in, for later on for ordaining her as, and taking her away from him, as well, along with his grandson, Rahula. And he ended up going to hell as well. And Devadatta is another example. Devadatta is said to have spouted, vomited blood. He was so angry. get angry and it blinds us. At that moment, we really think that anger is the best solution. We don't at that moment have conscious awareness that this is wrong. Even though intellectually we, we might know and we might try to be a nice, nice people. It's quite common for Buddhists, you know. Buddhists, we we t we're nice people, right? Why? Because we, we have all these teachings on how to be nice people. Christians, many Christians are nice people for similar reasons, because Christianity, I think, is particularly concerned with being nice. You know, turn the other cheek. It's a very powerful saying. Christians can be really nice. I met some really nice Christians. Of course, they have lots of other crazy ideas, but the niceness is there. But as with Buddhists, we can be very nice, but don't get us upset. You know, don't poke the hornet's nest, because Buddhists will get just as angry as anyone else. They'll. Uh, I've had I was, I've had monks yelling at me. Remember early on, I often tell this story. I was I'd come back from Canada. I spent some spent my first rains retreat in Canada. I came back to Thailand and not, I hadn't been there two weeks and we're sitting in the dining hall and suddenly there's a clatter beside us and I turn over and all the monks sitting in the dining room and I turn and one of the monks has gotten up and he's just pounding on one of the other monks. His nose is broken, he's got blood going everywhere. So I got up and started and, 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 and grabbed this one. Remember, out of all the monks, I was the only one. Uh, anyway, uh, at that moment, he thought punching this other monk was was the, the right thing to do. I mean, isn't it isn't it crazy how he can think, especially as a Buddhist monk, how he could come to the point where he thought that that was a good idea? He was totally blind, and he knew it. He felt awful about it. He, terribly ashamed. He's not a bad monk, he's just strong anger inside and he's built up. And delusion, I mean Devadatta is a good example of delusion. I imagine, now this guy wanted to be des uh, desire as well, he wanted to be the head of 
of the, the he wanted to be leader. He wanted the Buddha. Yeah, this, it was arrogance, you know, that's delusion. How we hold ourselves up, how we puff ourselves up, how we think how important we are, right? You look at these people who are so all puffed up. Anyone who has self-importance, and that's kind of ridiculous, really. They, they become less attractive, right? They become less impressive. They make everybody angry around them, and they make everyone f afraid of them, and they create such suffering. There's no greatness to be had in, in arrogance and pride. It's unpleasant. And the people don't see this, right? They don't see how, how silly they look when they puff themselves up like blowfish or like a peacock. We really think that there's good to be had by, by, by showing off. You know, if you ever hear people, it, it's a, there's culture, I've been in cultures, I guess I won't say which, but I've been in cultures where some of the people are incredibly inclined to brag about themselves. It's become a culture, in fact, where they tell you all the great, how great they are. How people are, are, are intent upon um, impressing upon you how great they are. And it just, I mean, mostly it just frustrates us and it makes us feel jealous and, and you know, because we're caught up in all that. But if you step back and as a meditator you think, you know, why, who, who could think that such a thing is a good idea? But, but of course, at the moment, for that person, I think showing off somehow impresses people. Somehow makes people like you more or something, I don't know. That's sort of what we think. We think we're going to feel good, it'll make us feel good. Because right? inside we usually hate ourselves, or we have lots of self-esteem issues, so we compensate by, see if everybody else thinks I'm great, then maybe I'll be great. Kind of funny to watch. This is why this is why Buddhas and Arahants have a funny sense of humor. They smile at the oddest things because it's kind of well, they're not odd really. It's just that all of us are too blind to to see the humor in it. Strutting around like peacocks, fighting like roosters. and copulating like dogs in heat where we're caught up in greed, anger, delusion. So you look at things like food, and if you ever watch people stuffing their face, if you look at even sexual activity, I mean, how ridiculous is it? How ridiculous is sexual sex? You know? What a silly activity. Kissing, take kissing to start with. What is kissing, you know? Just smack our lips together for a while. Isn't it absurd? Yet when you're kissing, it seems like the pinnacle, right? And people have written poems and songs and, and uh, books about kissing, about sex, about food, recipe books. I mean, doesn't it make you stop and scratch your head? We have books with pictures of, of fat and uh, grains and all, all oils and salts and sugars and stuff. All this stuff that eventually becomes urine and feces. I mean, that's what we're writing and that's what we're making books about and praising and poems and everything. So, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous, but the key, the, the more important point uh, is this understanding of how wrong we can be, of you know, realizing that we don't see it as ridiculous. 
and it's not even that it's unclear to us, it's that it really undeniably seems meaningful. So the, the, the key out of that is that we're wrong and that we can prove to ourselves that we're wrong and what we're wrong about very easily in fact all you have to do is look when a person looks when you look you see when you look you see when you see you know if you want to know you have to look if you want to know you have to see if you have, want to see you have to look look see know when you when, when you practice mindfulness, when you cultivate mindfulness. Desire and the objects of your desire seem undesirable. They become undesirable. You can clearly see, geez, what am I doing lusting after the human body? What am I doing lusting after this taste in my mouth of sugar and salt? It's like you pull away the veil, big man. It's like you turn on the light. Ajahn Tong, he, this monk here, he said once, I caught it on tape, he said, mindfulness is like a light. All the evil things, it was just a really, really good way of putting it. So all the evil things, they're all darkness. Mindfulness is like a light. When you turn on the light, the darkness disappears. That's really true. In that moment when you're mindful, the darkness has disappeared. So, important for us to understand. Important, and an important reason for us to be very careful about um, self-confidence, uh, being sure of ourselves. I think one of the things a meditator learns early on is that you can't trust yourself. You can't trust intuition. You have no reason to trust yourself. But, but unlike material scientists, you can change that. You don't need to tr trust yourself, but that you can come to see through your delusion. You can come to see uh, your misunderstanding. And you can come to clear them up to the point that, I mean, the argument might be made, how do you know that then you're seeing things clearly? But it's, it's the point that they then become in line with reality. So you might say, after you practice meditation, how do you know you're still not seeing things incorrectly? The difference is that now it's in line. Now your understanding is in line with reality, and that's important. That's clear. The way we see things, saw things before, was not in line with reality. These things that couldn't bring us happiness, we thought they could bring us happiness. They can't. You see impermanence. You see suffering. You see non-self. You see these qualities of reality that nothing is stable. Because of that, nothing can satisfy us. There's nothing that is me. That is mine. Nothing that is under our control. So, there you go. There's the Dhamma for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in.